Yeah, uh, first comment just on the water we were just talking about, and I, I'm sure the ship's already left the dock on this one, but I still don't get why the state of California uh, has maximum contaminant levels, in some cases 50% less than the federal contaminant levels, in some cases 90% less than the federal contaminant levels. The cost to communities, particularly, particularly small rural communities, uh, these bills are just enormous. Uh, you know, as as a result of them, I, I think that's probably a, a a topic that maybe we could do offline. You know, at some point in time, without uh, delving into what these gentlemen say, I kind of uh, my comments are associated with uh, Mr. Gallagher, Mr. Gray, and Mr. Gomez. I'm very concerned about what I've heard here this morning, and maybe it's just uh, I'm not feeling all that well, and I'm not hearing that well, but. I, I hear a lot about transparency and stakeholder input and everything, which is fantastic. But when $2.7 billion of this fund is talking about storage, and we have four sites that are, uh, sites, no pun intended, that are uh, identified, I think it was four, maybe it was five, uh, you know, in the bond, I really want to make sure and, uh, you know, Mr. Byrne, maybe this is to you, to your uh, commission, that there's some vision here that's going to call out for, you know, certain things that can guide. You know, I, I, you know the, the process, I've seen process work in local government, and it kind of takes you away. And when we've sold this bond, and Governor Brown sold this bond, he sold two things, and, you know, you know here, the rainy day fund and water storage. And we are going to need a lot of infrastructure bonds in this uh, state of California. And I, too, am very, very concerned about the fact if we get through the end and we don't have one of these big reservoirs done or two of them done, people are going to say, you guys just blew that money. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and look, at the projects are honorable, you know, the renovation projects and, uh, you know, all, all that was brought up here this morning. But people voted on this thing for water storage. We're in a drought. We're in the worst drought in as long as we can remember. And, and I, I just think that, uh, you know, that's something that really concerns me about our dialogue this morning. But I do appreciate everybody being here. I've learned a lot. Thank, Mr. thank you. Did you want to comment I on his I do comments? want to comment. Okay. Maybe Mr. Byrne does. But two things uh, uh, about the storage <laughs> component. First, one of the things that's very significant is that there was such alarm within the legislature that anything might be changed from the 2009 bond that might weaken the commitment to storage uh, led to the fact that the exact wording from the 2009 bond was taken into the current bond with the exception of dates that had already passed. And those dates were then changed to pretty much match the dates that existed in the 2009 bond. So what you might see as slowness was really the desire, I think, by the legislature, and the legislature can speak for itself, to preserve the balance and the commitments that were in the original language in 2009. Uh, Secondly, uh, let's not be quiet about the fact that these projects just don't magically appear and they have been studied and somehow they appear and would be approved before it even comes to the water commission and mr burn can comment on that it really requires people that are served by it to make financial commitments and to talk about what other people might have to put up so that you know that if the state's making a commitment it is really clear what those other things are. That does not happen in a day. And so uh, I think there's the opportunity dealing with the timelines that came from the legislature and the drafting of the bond uh, to make sure a lot of that ground is covered in a way that when the Water Commission completes its process by the deadline. The only thing that is going to determine uh, whether a project is successful 
is whether advocates put together a project that is successful and present it to the Water Commission in a way that the state commitment can be honored. And so it is not as if it's just sitting there, people are ready to go with all those commitments made and somehow the state process is delaying it. So that time really needs to be well spent in doing that and it will rise and fall on the mayor, completely se uh, separate from whatever the regulations are that the Water Commission puts together. It will rise and fall on the merits of those projects and so it is incumbent on advocates to answer those questions and be ready to present things that do meet it and do show merit. And so that is why I think that time will be valuable because if you have ever put together a project that is multi-billions of dollars and requires commitments from local jurisdictions, uh, that is not something that is overnight. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. Yeah. Secretary. We. Uh, you know, if anyone had thought that the muscles of legislative oversight had atrophied, we are exercising and giving them a workout today. Um, and so I want to thank the panel for that and the members of this committee for that as well. We actually have a second panel of stakeholders, and we told people that we'd have everyone out of here by noon. So I have two members that wanted to be returned to to make some comments. And I'll ask you to be brief because you might want to share them with the next panel, but we have a lot more work to do. Mr. Gray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I had a number of questions for those of you on the panel, but I'm going to try artfully weave this all together, uh, and you can uh, uh, take this with you, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to visit uh, at a later date as well. Um, you know, transparency and process are certainly a good thing. What I think works against us is uh, time and compartmentalization. And uh, there's a healthy, well, I don't call it a healthy, there is a uh, extreme uh, dose of cynicism that exists with my constituency uh, on this issue of storage, right, which has been an ongoing debate for many, many years, and I know Secretary Laird is all too familiar uh, uh, with this discussion. And, and, what, and I say time and compartmentalization works against us because uh, government increasingly across the board has demonstrated an inability uh, to do big projects uh, with expediency. And when we go to our voters and we look at, you know, public polling uh, data and talk to our constituents, you find uh, a cynicism around, well, there's a willingness to invest. There's a disbelief that we're going to spend the money on what we say we're going to spend the money on, right? And here, w with a massive investment that the legislature and the governor are making, and frankly, I know the governor, uh, you know, fully gets this because he put together a plan. Right, and he gets that all of it's got to work together. The uh, unimpaired flows need to work with the groundwater basins, which need to work with additional surface storage. And if it all doesn't happen, none of it works. And we have all the right people here uh, in this panel working in a variety of these areas. But I would just encourage you, and I think you've heard from uh, all the members that we need uh, to move this process. It needs to be transparent, obviously, uh, and, and open and a good process, but it also needs to move forward quickly and, and efficiently so that we can take back to our voters. And I would commend the chair for doing, you know, this oversight hearing right at the gate because we have to communicate to the people of California that we went out and asked to support and make this investment that things are, in fact, moving forward and the commitments and the expectations that Mr. Dodd referenced uh, come to fruition. Um, I mean, you know, in 1863, uh, we set out to build a railroad from Iowa to San Francisco, and in 1869, we were done. And it's awfully hard to go home and tell folks that we can't build a couple of reservoirs before 2024, which is the original question I asked, and I'll ask each of you privately to handicap that date for me as well. But uh, thank you for your service, thank you for your uh, attention to this, and thank you for uh, your responses today. Great, and, and thank you. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll ask for two things to occur at the same time. First of all, thank you very much to the panel. We are uh, very grateful for you um, being part of this, being engaged in this, and, uh, and being, you know, working very hard on something that Californians throughout the state really care a whole lot about. Anywhere I go and I talk to someone about, you know, what's the most important thing facing our state? Water. Across the board. So thank you very much for that. I'll ask that you um, sit, go ahead and, and, you know, you can leave the panel now. We'll ask the stakeholder group to come up uh, at that time. And so thank you for that. And then uh, allow Mr. Gallagher also to make his comments. But thank you. You can be seated.
excuse, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I think for, and this could go into the next segment uh, for the panel to answer, but I think what we're hearing a lot today is that there's, there's, there's various different aspects of this bond. And I think uh, Secretary Laird uh, hit it, nail, nailed it head on. This is an all of the above approach. And the bond has several different aspects of it. And we have to make sure that each component is done. That includes groundwater cleanup. That includes recycled water. That includes helping disadvantaged communities. And that includes storage. And so I think one thing that is important, I think, for our oversight going forward is that we allow each part of the bond to do its work. And so my question to the, to the panel is, do you agree that, uh, yes, each, each segment interrelates to each other, but we don't want to mix up those components? And I think what I was misunderstood earlier is I wasn't saying that a storage project couldn't have eco ecosystem benefits. Of course, it, it, it could and should, but it still must be a storage project in order to qualify for that bond money. And likewise, I wouldn't want, you know, a storage project to take money away from a recycled water project and not allow that part to do its part of the work. So do we agree that we need to ensure that each pot of money, if you will, goes towards its stated purpose and that we're not allowing other pr projects that might rightly be in a watershed uh, restoration component to sneak into another part that's supposed to be for storage. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Gallagher. Um, and thank you for the stakeholder panel for joining us today and for your patience. And I think that your contribution to this conversation is as important as all the other panels that we've had today. And so I uh, apologize that, uh, that you've had to wait to say something that I, I think all of you have to say is, is important. So glad to have you here as well. Many of you provided your expertise during the drafting of the water bond um, and also have experience with projects and programs implemented under prior bonds, uh, which is why I think what you have to say is so important. So uh, it's good to have you share some of your lessons that you've learned from those experiences and get your suggestions on how we can maximize the public benefits of the bond, which are incredibly important to Californians. Uh, Mr. Snow, just as we did with the prior panel, I'd like to start with you and then uh, proceed in the order uh, folks are listed on the agenda. As with the other panel, we've also provided your bios to our members and a brief description of who you represent. Um, and after all of you have had an opportunity to speak, then we'll engage in, uh, in that substantive Q&A that we all experienced in the past uh, 90 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Snow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, members. Uh, I'll, I'll cut back on my 45 minutes of planned presentation. Just, uh, I'll cut that in half easily. Um, I, first thing I want to do is put the bond in, in context of our water resource situation. And uh, it, California for several decades has experienced what I would call a steady decline in reliability. And our uh, water resource reality has been changing over decades and has been changing faster then our management institutions, policies, and infrastructure has been able to adapt. So we sit here with a lower level of reliability than we, set, we had probably several decades ago, primarily due to climate change, but also our interest in protecting and restoring the environment has resulted in this change. The, the bond is a significant jump start in terms of, of reinvesting because we've had decades of, of deferred investment in our water system. Um, and the structure that it takes, the portfolio-based approach, the diversification that has already been discussed is essential because there's no silver bullet. You cannot build a reservoir and fix California's problems. You can't install ultra-low flow toilets and fix California's problems. It really is moving forward um, in, in a very comprehensive way. Um, and you've already discussed a, a very important issue that we want to be quick and effective, but it's more important to make smart investments than quick investments. Uh, we will regret those. Um, and it's already been brought up. We don't know if we're in the fourth year of a, of a four-year drought or the fourth year of a 10-year drought, and, and that's part of the problem. Uh, the drought has revealed fundamental weaknesses in our system. Um, and I'll just hit a, a couple key things. And for me, the, the biggest issue that the bond does is gives us an opportunity for a very integrated approach. And what that means to me is maximizing the impact from these investments. 
and it's it's coordination. Actually, the Los Angeles area provides a good example of of the need to coordinate the bonds. They've had a historic groundwater contamination problem in the San Fernando Basin. They need to clean that up. When they clean it up, it'll open up opportunities to reclaim wastewater that's currently discharged to the ocean. It also opens up an opportunity to capture stormwater and put into the groundwater basins. It gives them a chance to take wet year water and store it in the basin. It gives them a chance for conservation. All of those are separate pots of money. And it's really important that Regions come forward with an integrated approach, and the state is able to respond to that integrated approach. Um, storage, we, we've lost snowpack, and snowpack isn't getting any better. There's no question that we need to invest in additional storage. I want to make sure that there's groundwater storage going on. That's probably the best way to provide a drought buffer. Capture high flows, get them in our groundwater basins where you can hold them for four, five, six years when the next drought comes along. Any surface water project, in my opinion, needs to be paired with groundwater, and that's the only way for it to be effective. If we had five more surface storage facilities today, they would all be below normal. We need to get that water in our groundwater basins. Um, two other points that I would make. Uh, the groundwater implementation that Member Gaines brought up. Uh, as we speak, there are regions struggling with coming together on how to proceed with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. We need to provide them assistance. There are some philanthropic foundations that are currently trying to provide assistance. The state needs to step up and help people form their uh, local agency and get on with the planning. Final specific issue I want to bring up is the disadvantaged communities. It's already been highlighted. The bond has capital money, and we can make a big impact on assuring that our communities have safe drinking water. It's actually quite an embarrassment that in the richest state, in the richest nation, people go without safe drinking water. The problem is we can build a shiny facility for them, but the O&M costs are outrageous for some of these treatment facilities. And I don't know that the bond can help, but I think the state and perhaps the legislature needs to step up and help solve that problem. Final point that I want to make is the bond is a, is a down payment. Uh, it's not enough. You, you, whether you look at the PPIC report from last year or the American Society of Civil Engineers, we're somewhere 6 to $12 billion a year behind adequate investment to catch up with the reliability that we need. So let's get the bond implemented, but let's look at other issues. Do we need 218 reform to help locals come up with their share of money? When do we start talking about a statewide water fee? I mean, these are all things that we need to talk about. We cannot allow there to be a sense that, boy, this bond has fixed California's water problems. We need to be able to move on. Um, final point, um, an obvious one. I like to give obvious advice. Uh, spend wisely and keep an eye on the ball, which is reliable supplies for the economy and the environment. And it's never too early to start talking about the next source of funding. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Snow. Ms. Tuck. Thank you, Chair Levine and members. I want to start by thanking all of you who worked on the bond last year. With all the hearings, all the meetings, it is a pleasure to be here this morning talking about implementation. So thank you. You asked us to talk about how do we, how does the state maximize the public benefits. My suggestions will fall in three categories. The first being efficiency, the second being effectiveness, and the third being accountability. And I'll be brief. So first, on efficiency, we agree that there needs to be smart investments, but we do think the money should get out the door. So efficiency is critical. We appreciate that the Brown administration, as you've heard today, is moving forward with the guideline process. That's the first key step. And we think they're being thoughtful in that area. It's very important, as everybody has said, that these processes be transparent and the public's able to provide input. The other part of efficiency is you know, what amounts should go out each year, what should be the timing, that kind of thing. And for some categories, recycling is a really good example. And I'm glad uh, the chair of the water board said they're going to move really quickly on the guidelines for recycling. That money can go out quickly, and there's projects that will have more recycled water and that will help our water supply reliability you know, problems. So that's, those things should just move forward quickly. You heard also a little bit today about the groundwater management funding in the bond. There's $100 million 
for the planning part of implementing the new law from last year. And the governor's budget has $21.3 million in it for this year. We're looking at is that the right number, but certainly you don't want to take too many years for getting that pot of money out or it's not going to be in time to help the new agencies plan for sustainable groundwater management. So we're looking really carefully at that pot, which is a very important pot. So that's a little bit on groundwater. So moving to the second category, effectiveness. And as has come out, the words of the act are very important. So the guidelines obviously have to be consistent with the law. But I think another imp um, important point is that the funding needs to be meaningful. We need to make sure that real projects go forward that are going to make a difference. And the devil's in the detail on the guidelines, of course. For example, recycling again, if there's a cap in the guidelines that says you can only have $5 million per project, then that's not going to be significant for some of the larger projects going forward. So it's key to look at some of those details that may not be in the statute but are in the guidelines. And so we'll be um, participating in some of those key processes. Third area is accountability. How do you make sure that the state gets there with Prop 1 implementation? Part of it is, you know, how much money got out the door, but more important is really having a look at what the outcomes are. And I think the LAO, Anton, in his report this morning uh, had that mentioned. For example, particularly on the water supply reliability money, what are the outcomes from that money? For the storage investments, what additional capacity and storage do we gain from the projects that are approved? And then, for example, recycling again. How much more recycled water will we have because of the funding that went to those projects? It's really obvious, but in some past bond implementation, there really wasn't focus on what did we get for the money, and I think we owe the public that. So those are my comments. Um, as Prop 1 implementation goes forward, we stand ready to provide information to the legislature. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, much Ms. Tuck. Uh, Mr. Shearing. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, and members of the uh, committee. Uh, I'm Chris Shearing. I, I am here on behalf of the California Farm Bureau Federation, and I'm going to try to drastically foreshorten my remarks because much has been said, and I know you're trying to get out of here by noon. So um, Farm Bureau is extremely happy that the bond passed, of course, a uh, tremendous uh, opportunity after a generation of uh, inactivity or, or at least uh, uh, not a significant enough activity on the infrastructure uh, front as California has grown. And and as, as environmental policy has been overlaid onto our uh, water uh, system. So, and I think the recent uh, drought cycle has underscored of that. Um, looking forward, we're looking at comprehensive groundwater regulation. Uh, we're looking at a declining snowpack, and uh, we are looking at uh, other climate uh, effects on hydrology, which are going to turn this into a much flashier system. All of that uh, points straight in the direction of the importance of storage, in our view. I just have two points I want to I make. Um, I was struck when I listened to testimony before the California uh, Water Commission a couple of weeks ago uh, by comments I heard from a certain quarter uh, which were, uh, let's say, somewhat uh, skeptical of the public benefits um, uh, of surface storage projects. And it struck me, um, uh, perhaps that's an old antagonism within that community to surface storage projects, and I understand that. Um, but it struck me that those same uh, interests uh, just a couple of years ago before the state board in uh, the flow informational flow proceedings that the State Board entertained uh, w lobbied heavily uh, for uh, lots of uh, in-stream flows uh, for the support of the ecosystem and fisheries. So it seems to me that uh, for my money the fish don't care where the flows come from um, and it's uh, far better to, to build forward with this bond uh, money to provide those ecosystem benefits uh, than to pursue policies that result in the retirement of water rights to protect fisheries. So I'm glad we're here today uh, on that front. Um, the other thing, uh, I guess the, the only other recommendation I would give, because we're trying to move quickly, is that uh, I detected uh, uh, perhaps a little bit of uh, uh, shading in Mr. Snow's comments towards groundwater projects, and we certainly think groundwater projects can have many public benefits, uh, both direct and indirect. Um, but we would uh, urge the uh, Water Commissioner and others going forward, uh, as we decide how to spend this bond money, to take a, a, a very hard look at the projects that are already on the table, uh, that are out 
front uh, in terms of planning. Uh, I am talking about surface storage projects uh, that uh, are well known in the CalFed uh, process and others. Uh, those seems to be uh, in an advanced state of planning. Uh, the reviews, uh, or I should say the studies that I have heard, uh, uh, show that those projects can provide a tremendous public benefit um, uh, in their operation. And, um, you know, in some, some respects, uh, some of them are, in, if not, uh, they're not shovel ready, but they're in advanced stages of planning. And uh, I would echo, uh, I think it was Mr. Dodd's uh, comments uh, earlier that uh, this, this bond presents us with a pretty large chunk of money, and it may not come around again for a long time. Um, so uh, we ought to be looking at the uh, big opportunities rather than the smaller opportunities as we go forward. And with that, I guess the final thing I would uh, echo was Mr. Gray's comments, uh, which is that the uh, Transcontinental Railroad was built in six years. I think he said uh, we, we too would like to see forward motion on uh, building projects. So that's it for me. All right, I want to just, uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Schering, um, and thank you for your sensitivity that we did want to follow the amount of time that we were giving people as guidance, but I do not want uh, Mr. Carrillo or Obiji to feel rushed. Uh, what you have to say is incredibly important to us and informative to us. Um, and so please, Mr. Carrillo. Thank you very much, Chair. Members, Omar Carrillo, Community Water Center. Community Water Center works um, with and for rural communities, small disadvantaged rural communities, many of which have lacked access to safe, affordable, clean water for many years. So long before the drought declaration of 2014, you had communities who had bad water who were running out of water. And one of the things that we've um, known for a long time is that that funding is slow to get to these communities and there are many barriers to being able to secure resources. Uh, we were very active in developing and working with Assemblymember Rendon and other members to make sure and ensure Prop 1 does have uh, DAC specific resources and resources that help communities out, specifically those that lack safe drinking water. So we definitely do have very specific recommendations of which um, for the most part, we know that the economies of scale lack in these. These communities are very small. We're talking about 1,000 population and below, 200 you know, population and below. We're talking about severely disadvantaged communities, a lot of which are in rural areas. So one of the things, the first thing, and I have a few recommendations just in terms of moving forward with this appropriation process and for, cons uh, for consideration is that we need to prioritize the vulnerable communities, prioritize the human right to water. And what that means is that there was 34 $32 billion, in, including this bond, in terms of water bond resources, um, that a total um, since, two, two, uh, since 2000. Only 2% 2 of that has gone to small communities for drinking water and wastewater resources. So moving forward, we definitely have to focus those resources on these small communities. Um, and I've already mentioned who those are, severely disadvantaged, very small communities. We should not prioritize shovel-ready projects over DACs. And the reason I mention that is because Prop 84 did actually have a clause in there that said that certain key sections talked about immediate projects or projects, prioritized immediate projects versus projects that um, needed some planning and pre-planning to go with. So a lot of the communities that we work with require a lot of work before they actually are shovel-ready. Okay, so we should not prioritize shovel-ready um, over DAC projects. We should also prioritize TA resources. There was some mention, Assembly Member Rendon mentioned technical assistance. Technical assistance, there's $25 million in this in Prop 1. What that means is we're talking about project development, community engagement, grant writing, project management, engineering, environmental review, and TMF, training, um, at training and financial assistance. Technical assistance has to help these communities become competitive ultimately for the bricks and mortar for the permanent source funding. Um, we should also look at funding consolidations. Bottom line is that we have 7,500 um, re regulated drinking water systems in the state and we should, you know, some of the systems we work with would want to work with other systems to consolidate. Maybe several systems, small systems can come together. So we definitely should work towards aggressively and the state should look aggressively and into transitioning some of these small communities towards a more con uh, uh, towards consolidation and a more permanent um, for a more permanent water source and being more sustainable. Two more points: funding and O and M is critical. And O and M, um, a lot of the communities that we work with, play pay upwards of a hundred dollars for you know just water 
That's, you know, and the bottom line is that some of, a lot of those costs are associated with just operating and maintaining their systems. And so we should look at not just Prop 1, but we should look at other sources. So the state has cleanup and abatement resource that helps communities that actually have contaminated drinking water. We should also look more aggressively at possibly a water surcharge, public goods charge, maybe even looking at some of the key contaminants, maybe fertilizer fee. Those are all ways of actually addressing some of the major issues impacting these communities. Lastly, I'll mention that we are big proponents of developing and creating an office um, within the state water board that systematically addresses the issues of small communities. So, you know, there was mentioned earlier, Felicia, uh, Chair Felicia Marquez from the state water board said that they're bringing together their financial and program programmatic uh, components within the state water board. What we would like to see is a collaborative effort that starts addressing the list of small systems Right now, we have 183 systems that we know of, but here soon with Hex Chrome, we're, there's going to be possibly hundreds more. So we know who these systems are. This office would be responsible for working with these small systems to systematically um, have them work together and consolidate. And uh, with that, I will um, leave it with just mentioning that we are going into the fourth year of drought. Things are going to get more critical and difficult, and we look forward to working with all of you and st other stakeholders to ensure that communities are safeguarded against drought impacts, and Community Water Center is a resource for all. I encourage you and your staff to reach out to us. Thank you.